Still good morning, good morning everybody. Give us two minutes, because we have uh, a bonus for you. We have an extra speaker, a surprise, so. Hold on, hold on to your seats. <laughs> Yes. But don't go away from me. Don't That's go right. too far away from me. <laughs> Do the photo first? Okay. You're the boss. <laughs> Maybe we should start. Just start the conversation. She'll she'll be hearing us. Well, Maria will hear us. Well. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Abdul Al Kipsi. I'm the managing director for programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise. Uh, CIPE, um, or as they call us in Latin America, CIPE, we are an organization at the intersection of democracy and democracy strengthening, uh, but also on uh, free enterprise in the market, so market uh, uh, reform, market oriented reform. Hi, Maria. And, um, so the issue, and we're one of the core institutes of the National Endowment for Democracy, and for just full disclosure, I worked at the NED before I joined CIPE. So Forum 2000 is very important to me, and it's, a, it's an important organization, and this is to me probably the most important meeting I attend the, uh, in the year. And for CIPE, it's been important for us to include economic issues, economic coercion, sanctions, into what Democrats and democracy means. It's very important. So, Jakob, Forum 2000, thank you very, very much for allowing us to do that. And the issue of sanctions is not an easy issue to talk, right? So, um, sanctions have always been one of the tools we've used, right? But with the invasion, with the, with the Kremlin's-led invasion of Ukraine, it has become more important, more necessary. Um, it's a tool to uh, punish, but a tool also to deter. Sometimes controversial, I don't think in this room it is, but we'll, we'll, we'll test it sometime later. But there's the, the, it has been inconsistent uh, application. So we see uh, the perceptions from the West is different than we see actually on the ground. And there are sanction, uh, sanction busting happens all over the world from financial capitals like Dubai or, or other places uh, to actual uh, smuggling of goods. And our experience at SIPE has been actually in Georgia more than any other place. It's not to pick on Georgia, but we've seen that. We've seen how, how it happens, how even uh, spare parts for uh, Airbus and Boeing planes go from Georgia. And the influences in, of Russia over Georgia, we see, it helps that a lot. And the Russian population, the Russian citizens of Georgia also give that nexus added uh, import, importance. Um, so, I would like to discuss methods, strategies of how to make them more effective, how to make sanctions more effective. And boy, do we have a fantastic panel for that today. We're so fortunate to have with us His Excellency Jan Lipovsky, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Czechia. Thank you for joining us. Hello and thank you. Thank you. We have His Excellency Wojciech. Gervel, uh, Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Poland. Good morning. Brandon Silver, Director of Policy and Projects at the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights uh, in Canada. Orisia Lutsevich, Deputy Director for Russia and Eurasia Program at Chatham House, Ukraine, United Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you. And we're added by Maria Yonova from Ukraine, and that's such an, a, a beautiful addition. Thank you, Jakob, thank you, Maria, for joining us. I'd like to keep you, after you hear everybody, to give us your own comments, because you will frame this for us, because it's about 
Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions in there. And I'll start with His Excellency Minister Lebovsky. Um, the first is the Czech government. If you can tell us uh, what kind of diplomatic strategies you're adapting uh, in light of the sanction evasion efforts and what are your policies towards that? Yes, uh, I have to say uh, first and foremost that uh, for us uh, the sanction policies and uh, building up uh, real sanction policy uh, of Czechia and of the EU is uh, one of the most important tasks uh, for our diplomacy, for our uh, of our foreign, foreign affairs policy. And uh, it goes hand in hand on the national level, but also on the level of multilateral organizations like the EU and, uh, and the others. Uh, and for, for, for the EU, uh, sanctions really means a very significant uh, tool of foreign policy. And uh, you are uh, very right uh, asking about uh, the evasion of sanctions. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, immediately after the first sanction regimes were introduced, this question arised. We did not know how it will happen. Uh, now it's obvious that we see the rise of uh, trade through different countries, especially in, in Central Asia. And uh, there is no uh, simple, easy solution to that. Uh, but on the EU level, it's uh, the most important thing which needs to happen, and it's slowly happening. It is EU, so it is slowly but surely uh, happening. It's uh, the change of the principle that those sanctions regimes are valid only for the countries of the EU. So basically, the EU is slowly shifting to extraterritoriality of sanctions mm -hmm. regimes, uh, not in a way as we can observe them, for example, in the USA, but in a way that EU will assess, look at, and, and try to understand what is happening in other countries, and it will, it will have uh, impact uh, later on, on specific uh, companies. Uh, you know, this is something uh, which is very actively being discussed. So, it's important shift. It is happening. It is happening uh, on the EU pace, uh, but the Czech diplomacy, uh, the, the Czech Republic, is very active in that process, and we are supporting that as much as uh, possible. Let me also mention that to have an effective um, uh, enforcement of sanctions, being it nationally or internationally, being it um, in the EU, being it extraterritorial, uh, we need to have a set of tools, institutions, which are able to monitor flows of goods, flows of goods of dual use, mm -hmm. military goods, etc. Uh, in this sense, um, in this sense, uh, Czechia is very well prepared. We have very good institutions. My ministry, uh, we have a special department for that, um, secret services, all those institutions regulating uh, different aspects of trade. Ministry of, of Trade is playing a very important role in that. Also, uh, we need a better understanding on the EU level. It was during our presidency when we uh, were able uh, to add the violation of restricting measures to the list of the so-called EU crimes. Um, uh, which is uh, included in the Treaty on the Function of the EU. So uh, those things are happening, and now we need to, uh, we need to uh, continue, continue with that. Thank you very much. Last but Please. not least, we have our uh, national sanction law, um, briefly called Magnitsky Law, Czech Magnitsky Law. Uh, so we have a national listing, which is very short, but we are very active in the EU to put the new names on it, which uh, we are obliged by the law to do so. So this is one very specific thing which we were able to achieve here in, in Czechia. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I I'm going to out you. When I, ha when I was talking with Mr. Lipowski uh, in the back, he said, I'd rather answer questions from the audience than just mm -hmm. talk. So uh, we have this. I'm going to be throwing it at you to ask questions. We're going to have some fun later. So we're going to try to make a brief here and then uh, take questions from the audience. And I'm going to address under Secretary Gerwell now, if I, if I may. Poland is in a tough neighborhood, right? <laughs> so borders are difficult. And you, you share significant borders with countries uh, where smuggling activities have intensified. What is Poland doing about that? And are you successful? It's... Um First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's so wonderful to be in Prague, this, this incredibly beautiful city. Also, the, 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 the setup is, reminds me of my own hometown. I come from Gdynia next to Gdańsk, and in Gdańsk there is a Philharmony with precisely this <laughs> setting. So it reminds me like I'm in a, in a concert. The, 
but uh, but also the national uh, national endowment for democracy thank you for for your activities and also it was an inspiration for us to create so uh, so called the european endowment for democracy some years ago so yeah. so 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 great to meet our friends from the from from, from this organization but uh uh, you know the borders. I get to the borders and, and this, uh, but but maybe just on the sanctions. I I, I I cannot agree more with everything that that His Excellency Minister has said. Uh, it, uh, this time has been so uh, uh, so important for us to, to 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 work together and to to see Czech Republic taking such a such a such a principled position and uh, and effective position. It's. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to work uh, to uh, to work together. Also, congratulations on the Magnitsky um, uh, law. We, you know, when, when it comes to the sanctions, uh, still, I just a few words. We we also focus very much now uh, as a priority on the on the making sure that circumvention of sanctions doesn't 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 work with uh, vis-à-vis -vis Russia, but also Belarus. We always try to remember Belarus. Mm -hmm. pressuring third countries uh, using different legal instruments and so on that we were also uh, trying to inspire and, and are now in place. But also we, we note certain sectors that are particularly um, sen uh, sen uh, vulnerable to circumvention, like the banking sector, for instance, or the, or the military or the oil, uh, oil uh, imports and so on, the, the mixing of the oil and then, then exporting it, for instance. Uh, um, uh, so much to be said about sanctions, but you said to be brief, so I, I get no, to, the, okay. to the to the basic <laughs> points. Uh, the the you know the that's true. The, the, the it's a turbulent area. So we, as as probably most of uh, I mean I'm sure you, all of you know, we we have had a, a special situation on our Belarusian border, and uh, we we build this uh, uh, we build that uh, very um, strong fence, right? So it's the most it's the most protected. Um, border now in in all of the Schengen zone, and so, so far we've had like 40 delegations from you know from NATO, uh, Frontex, and so on to to look at the technical details how 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 it works. And there's always this really uh, great opinion. You know, it's a it's a it's a it's a very much a, a system of sensors that that allows us to to really survey everything that is happening on the border. Recently, we also introduced uh, certain checks on the on the Slovak border. This is temporary. This is only in the direction of Poland, and this is uh, following the principles of a risk analysis of the vehicles of individuals only. So not to stop all the vehicles, but uh, but uh, and it's but it's functioning in all the designated places that you can cross the border. We, we basically uh, introduced this uh, this uh, on this level, but also we. We, we have worked on the on the on the EU level. You know, there was a meeting recently in Grenada of the EU leaders, and uh, our Prime Minister took some, you know, made some proposals uh, about uh, regarding the the stronger protection of the ex EU external border, about the uh, people smugglers uh, and those who support them. That we, we, you know, we should strengthen the fight against them, and so on and so on. So it's a um, Okay, just a very general uh, response, but uh, I understand we are looking forward to a discussion. No, it's okay, but if I, if I can add to that, um, how's Poland, mm. uh, or is Poland, mm. working with neighboring countries mm -hmm. to try to enforce these sanctions? Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the efforts you're working on? Mm. The, the, the sanctions, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, the, we very much work with, uh, within the, you know, within a, as broad framework as possible. So, of course, within the EU framework, that's the that's the the most basic framework. But we also are a very strong advocate of of working together with the United States, with, with, with UK, and so on. So we 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 very much uh, you know we we are more effective if we work together. Also, circumvention. I mean, it requires a lot of uh, insights, right? So the exchange of information is very important and. Uh, uh, mm, so, so uh, also on the uh, even like on the individual sanctions, there is this is something called EU Global Human Rights Sanctions Regime that that is in place now. And uh, for instance, regarding facial recognition in Moscow, right? So it's, a, so it's not that we, mm, we we cannot do anything anything alone. We have to do everything together, right? So it's a. Uh, 
So, so the same regarding accountability, for instance, because sanctions is one way to, we, we have to work to diminish the Russia's uh, ability to capacity to to continue this this war effort and uh, and that's the most effective one of the most effective ways is to not only to provide you know some different sorts of support to Ukraine and so on to strengthen ourselves but but work through sanctions but also work on accountability measures and here for instance we have a we have our prosecutor's office in Warsaw working on this you know we it has already had uh, 100 1400 witnesses and so on that it that it uh, heard the testimonies of, but but then you know we 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 build on this to to work together. For instance, on this justice, it's called a justice. Um, let me just check the justice joint investigative investigation team. Mm. So so we 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 had a, uh, we now cooperate with uh, Lithuania, Ukraine, Slovakia, Estonia, Latvia, Romania, and so on to you know, to, 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 to work together on this and then, uh, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to switch to Brandon, and um, you're a human rights lawyer. You work for a human rights organization. And it's a tough question for you, but um, as we're applying sanctions to punish the Kremlin for all its aggression in, in Ukraine and all what's going on, how do we differentiate that, at least attempt, and make sure that what we're trying to do to punish Russia and deter Russia from its aggression, we're not actually punishing the Russian people themselves. Well, thank you, Abdu. It's an important question. And I, I think being in Czechia, I'll quote uh, Czech novelist uh, Milan Kundera in response that mm. the, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. So at the outset, let us not forget that when we talk about sanctions or laws, what we're really talking about is lives. The people butchered in Bucha, the 1.1 million forced deportations, including 250,000 children. Our responsibility as free nations to ensure that our banking systems, our economies are not complicit in those crimes. Uh, that those who are responsible for denying the rights of their compatriots, not only in Ukraine, but in Russia as well. I know Vladimir Karamurz is a friend. We've got mm -hmm. many people in the audience from the Russian Democratic mm -hmm. opposition that you know, people who are denying their rights are not able to enjoy the freedoms that they deny them at home in our countries abroad. And, um, you know, I believe that sanctions um, are already uh, having an effect on the architects of oppression and, and aggression uh, and, and stopping the financial flows that, that fund their oppression. Um, you know, these uh, visa bans, asset seizures, um, business dealing prohibitions are uh, ensuring that uh, our economies are, are off limits to those bad actors. And I, I want to publicly commend Minister Lepavsky for his important work in adopting the Magnitsky laws in Czechia that, mm. uh, that he referenced, because I think those are a very effective response to the uh, question that you raised. It ensures that these are laser-targeted sanctions on the entities and the individuals that are responsible for these crimes. And uh, the only issue that I think, uh, you know, sort of dovetails with, with your, your question comes down to enforcement. Um, we have to make sure that after these listings are undertaken, after these bad actors are designated, that they cannot continue their crimes against uh, those victims. And, you know, something we've been advocating for at the Wallenberg Center, our institution is co-chair of a global civil society coalition on sanctions. So there's about 400 other NGOs working on sanctions issues and uh, that, that are a part of this group. And something that we've been calling for is a government sanctions coalition. So a coordinating platform mm. for all those states that have Magnitsky laws to ensure that asset flight doesn't occur. You know, if Czechia were to sanction someone, or if Canada were to sanction someone, they could pack their bags, move their businesses to the UK. If the UK had sanctioned them, they'll move to the US. We have to make sure that there's greater coordination. Our, our coalition did a study analyzing um, most Magnitsky jurisdictions and actually found that the vast majority of designations are done unilaterally. Now, don't get me wrong, moral mm -hmm. courage is important, and if you have information, you should act upon it. 
but it's all the more effective if it's done in unison and if there are a number of states collectively um, ensuring that their jurisdictions are off limits to those bad actors. Mm -hmm. um, so I think establishing such a coordination group should be a, a priority for states that are looking to ensure the protection of human rights of the victims and, and also ensuring that uh, you know, civilians are, are protected. Um, from, from something that isn't too broad, but uh, you know, also to protect our own national sovereignty. You've written extensively, Abdu, on the uh, effects, corrosive effects of corrupt foreign capital, and, yes. and I think you know, this is about protecting our own citizens too from the dangerous effects that, that these bad actors have by want, allowing um, you know, us to launder their assets in our, in our jurisdictions. Thank, thank you very much, Brandon. And you know, the human rights uh, issue has another side of that coin. Um, maybe we should all work together on an on a education campaign for those who are engaged in um, sanctions evasion that are actually enabling human rights atrocities inside Ukraine. They're enabling the rape, they're enabling the murder, they're enabling the mass uh, 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 displacement of people inside. These are human rights aggressions. Anybody mm -hmm. who's engaged in the evasion of it is actually enabling uh, these human rights aggressions. Uh, uh, is something to comment about it before I go to the uh, next one? Yeah, well, um, I, I think edu these, these people are bad actors, and, and education won't, won't prevent them from continuing so trying to do so. I, I, I think, you know, it, firstly, going after the enablers. So who, who are allowing these crimes to occur? It requires law firms, accounting firms, a lot of, you know, people that could potentially be persuaded. These, those involved in sanctions evasion you know, I think can be stopped by stronger laws, by stronger coordination, things like um, uh, publicly accessible, accessible, uh, accessible beneficial ownership registries that allow the public, that allow civil society to do a lot of the work. Again, you know, I'll, I'll quote another great Czech statesman who inspires us all, Václav Havel, when he said that civil society is the truest fundamental of democracy. It shouldn't only be, uh, as you know, Minister Lepofsky uh, referenced, you know, check security services, intelligence. I think the work being done by human rights organizations, by journalists in tracking uh, these assets have been really effective. And if they're given the resources, if you know, there's a beneficial ownership registry created, they could track down these assets and we could, sanction, we could ensure that those bad actors are sanctioned and that those who enable them are sanctioned. And finally, from uh, the rhetorical effect you described of how do you educate, uh, I think that something we should be discussing a bit more is asset repurposing. Um, so, not only uh, freezing, but seizing. Mm -hmm. Take those assets, and mm -hmm. you know, if it's about Russian aggression against Ukraine, it can be used for the reconstruction of Ukraine. If it's about victims who've lost uh, livelihoods, limbs, loved ones, it can be helped to, it could help redress um, those uh, uh, crimes and help them rebuild their lives. And I think the message that sends, you know, of, of uh, a, a perpetrator no longer able to benefit from those resources, but rather the stories of the victims or of the destruction being centered of what this money actually means. That money is, is not just amorphous, it is tangible. It means these lives that were broken are being rebuilt and these properties that were destroyed, these, these centers of civic society can be rebuilt and that changes the narrative, I think. Thank you, Brandon. We're going to shift again, uh, uh, Orissia, if I may. I mean, Chatham House is known one of the top think tanks in the world. I don't know you've done studies about this. So maybe if you can give us a little, a, a brief but deep dive into key strategic vulnerabilities in the current sanctions framework against, against Russia. What are the vulnerabilities in them, if you can enlighten us? Thanks, Abdu. I think the first uh, piece I wrote when Russia, you know, bombed uh, outskirts of Kiev on the 24th of February was about sanctions being an uh, economic weapon. If we don't want to send our soldiers from the West, if we don't want to, you know, help Ukraine in any other way, this is the bare minimum that should be done to actually, and this is the question, what should it do? Because you mentioned quite a lot the word punish. Yeah. while you were introducing. I think there are, should be three purposes. We should be very clear of what we are trying to achieve with sanction weapon. And that is to basically curtail the authoritarian system, to put it back in the box, because Putin was master of different jurisdictions, including London, including Zurich, including Denver, including Florida, you name it. Um, we also need to prevent the reconstitution of the armed forces of Russia to continue the war. Uh, 
And we need to put pressure on the system. And this is where I slightly disagree with you about whether people, where we should making this distinction and thinking too much about the Russian people. Russian people support this war. Well, you know, there's not massive uh, pro uh, protests. We, yes, we have some political prisoners, but we do see Russian people supporting imperialism. Widely, it's, it's shown in all public opinion polls. So we do want to show to Russian people that basically autocracy cannot deliver them good life. Because if we provide good life to Russian people, they will never ask themselves the question what they did wrong. So I think it's very important always to, to remember this question, why are we doing it? Because too ma many people are now saying sanctions are not working, sanctions are, didn't deter Russia, you also mentioned deterrence, mm -hmm. they didn't deter Russia, so somebody might say, look, it's not working, um, but I actually think they are working. And um, our um, analysts estimate that Russia has already lost about 1.5 trillion in foregone economic development, losses of assets, trade, industrial production. That is roughly an annual GDP. It's a lot. Russia is deindustrializing. Of course, it still can trade, sell its energy resources, and we do see the increase in uh, trade with India, with China, but not only, we actually have an increase in trade with the Netherlands, the Belgium, and that is LNG, this is energy resources. So um, it's all good to start, um, for example, I imposing secondary sanctions like Americans did on the Chinese companies, right? They've um, uh, listed 42 companies, but again, Ukrainian monitoring shows that uh, there are out of 172 components that are being used in drones, majority of them comes from U.S. Texas Instruments. 120 of those parts were coming from, uh, and also Japan, Swiss, and China was down the list. So. Uh, I agree with the um, panel here that we should clearly focus on evasion and close all those loopholes. But we should work on a new package of sanctions. This is the European Union, I think, was it like 12 or 13 now? And I lost a bit counting. But we need, and what these sanctions should, um, uh, the package should, uh, they should show that we mean serious about this. That it's not going to fall apart in a year or two, that Russian elites must understand that they will not be able to come back to any financial markets anytime soon. They will not have any access to technology, including oil and drilling technology, that is the backbone of Russian uh, economy. They should look very closely at the defense industry, at Russian nuclear industry, uh, at propagandists that are spilling this vicious disinformation mm. inside Russia and militarizing their own society. We should clearly um, uh, confiscate those assets. And here U.S. leadership is key, I think, because EU will, in a way, um, look very much up to what the United States is doing. There is a special working group on um, uh, assets trying to find out the um, legal solution to this. But I think it requires more political leadership than legal solution. And finally, I'll say it's about uh, Western companies still working in Russia. We have, uh, out of those 3,000 that declared um, that they will exit, only half exited. Mm. And so they still fill in Russian coffers with their tax uh, revenues that then kill Ukrainians. So it's uh, important to also look at our own reflection in the mirror of our own economies and um, uh, vulnerabilities that we have within that help Russia um, fill in its war chest. Thank you, Thank you Russia. Maria, uh, you've heard all of them, you've heard me. Uh, if you can tell us your perspective as a Ukrainian and what are the sanction evasion doing to Ukraine today? Thank you, Abdul. Dear Minister, dear colleagues and participants, as a member of the Parliament and a member of Foreign Affairs Committee, of course, uh, uh, I'll be uh, talking very honest on this Please. very unpleasant topic, as already mentioned, for many governments. And we also realize the sacrifice, uh, economic sacrifice of other countries. But uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, in Ukraine, the war is already almost 10 years. And uh, also, sorry to remind, but when there was no adequate reaction 
in March 2014. Mm. Uh, we also remember cheap gas for Europeans and very big and fast money. And that was a green line for Putin to go further. And that is why today is 601 days of full-scale invasion. And I think that this honest conversation, and I really thank uh, to Forum to, uh, to Southern, that we can discuss uh, it's really very openly, uh, that we also have to give very adequate and honest answer. Because uh, as also a lot of my colleagues has mentioned during the panels, this war is not between Russia and uh, Ukraine. This war is also uh, against Putin, against international law, and not only between democracy and autocracy. And that is why altogether and only in unity we can really um, stop him in Ukraine because he will not knock to other European countries. He will just bomb and send missiles and rockets one moment. And in this regard, uh, of course, um, we are not asking boots on the ground. And we really appreciate all the support, what we have already uh, got. And also, we really thank also Czech Republic uh, for the weaponry, for the sanctions. It's really very brave and decisive. Um, a decision, but we need also help on the policy, as uh, Orisa mentioned, on the battlefield of sanctions and also international law. And that is why I will uh, say that, number one, uh, that, uh, again, not to forget that the strategy of each country has to be that Ukraine is just an overture for Putin for another country. Yeah. Uh, my second issue that... Um, if we will see the sanctions uh, as a factor for strengthening your resilience and independence, so like for each country, because it's also a cleansing your economy and, you know, to find all this toxic influence of not only aggressor as Russia, but, but also other rogue nations. Uh, uh, for example, uh, again, my favorite uh, topic, gas. If we will see uh, uh, um, that uh, to get cheap gas and get some economic bonuses, but uh, nowadays we see how um, no Europe is spending billions, uh, of course, for example, for green economy, for um, you know, for, for new technologies. So it's 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 really better for their own economies. So my uh, third issue is that. Um, Russian uh, sanctions against Russia must be extended to other key economic areas. As mm -hmm. um, Orisa also has mentioned, not only nuclear fuel, not only banking system, unfortunately among 330 Russian banks, uh, swift, uh, uh, they were swift off only around 30 banks. So uh, also it's about LNG, it's about logistic uh, marines uh, um, uh, transporting uh, companies. So it's about uh, military goods, as Arisa also has man mm. ma mentioned. So, you know, not to finance impunity. Uh, and also not to, I, I, uh, I, can't, I don't want to say this word, but not to be a complice of uh, Russia Federation. So, and more sanctions, and I think that it will be less support of India and China to Russia Federation. So we, we will cover uh, uh, many, um, uh, many uh, sectors. Also, I think the biggest sanction against Russia is membership of Ukraine's membership in the mm -hmm. EU and NATO. And that is why I think that altogether we have to work and uh, with Americans uh, that uh, Washington summit has to be successful in spring uh, 2024. Uh, you know, not to be afraid. We are talking here really about political leadership. We really are talking about very uh, operative and decisive decisions, and when I'm talking about international justice, so it's also about international court, because now we hear that a lot of discussions about not international court, we, we say mm -hmm. international aside tribunal, so it's different, it's like hybrid, we, we really do not want to accept any hybrid stories also about like some other security guarantees and so on, we have to be very clear because it's not only about us. And my final message, uh, it's also about 
our common intelligence agencies. Unfortunately, they have failed in a lot of topics. So I think that it will be a great job you know, to renew their work uh, uh, of, uh, in economic issues. And Russian society. More sanctions to Russia Federation. It will be more, uh, you know, more discussions inside anyway Russian society because every day Putin sent them to war. And it's Russian people who are killing who are raping and who are tortured. That is why they have also to be punished and ab about informational war. I'm sure that, and I really would like, that all EU and G7 countries has to cut so-called Russian journalists, opposition journalists, from their societies because we have already we have already had this time when we had so-called Russian op op opposition uh, journalists. We failed, and that is why we don't want them uh, to poison another societies uh, and uh, you, uh, to finalize value or price and I think that we have to be clear on this thank you very much you could see how rich this panel is so we have this I'm gonna come to you if anybody has a question I have a lady in the back but before I do that if you allow me it occurred to me I wish Jakob was here uh, by a uh, uh, audience participation so and a very very scientific uh, poll right now <laughs> So, by a show of hands, how many of you feel sanctions are working? Not fully, but yeah. It's okay. Partially, they're working. Okay. Good number. Now, how many of you feel we should keep them on, if not strengthening them? Strengthening. Almost, almost unanimous. Almost unanimous. Almost unanimous. Uh, Forum 2000, record that as part of the output of this session, that this very scientific poll. Uh, I don't know, technology, can I walk back and forth with the microphone? With this on me? Yeah. The lady there. Do I need to speak into it? Yes, just speak into okay. it. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a few questions, but they're relatively quick, so maybe you can just give me a few answers. Um, so what is the EU stance on secondary sanctions? So the U.S. has already sanctioned a few, for example, Kyrgyz companies that were accused of sanctions violations and helping Russia get sanctioned technology. What is the EU's position on that? Because the EU is notorious for um, not wanting to apply secondary sanctions. Um, it was mentioned that the sanctions circumvention is already illegal on the EU level. So the last time I checked, the draft law is still being reviewed by the European Parliament. So I would just need a clarification of that. Is that legal? Is that illegal on the EU level? Um, fine, um, I'm curious of what also the EU is going to do about the trade with third countries. So um, some uh, EU countries stop trading with Russia as much as before the full-scale invasion. But if you look at the exports, import statistics, uh, Germany, other countries, uh, sales to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, other stands, and Russia's periphery um, have increased by 300, 400, 200 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this basically a lot of uh, goods that just disappear, right? So this is like a big uh, black hole of sanctioned stuff that just goes through these countries to Russia. And finally, what are you doing about, about the gas curve out for a few countries within the EU that are still getting um, the gas, like Austria, I think, Slovakia, and so on? So if you could address if all... If you can identify yourself quickly, just name, oh. organization, and country. Sure. So my name is Anna Romandash. I am a journalist uh, from Ukraine, also a researcher on sanctions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnan, for doing that. Um, open to anybody you want to answer, please, Ms. Your Excellency. Very good questions, <clears throat> and it's obvious uh, that all those three areas are um, something where more can be more can be done. Um, secondary sanctions, sa sanctions circumvention, uh, that's the big theme which uh, the EU is slowly moving on, probably not, uh, not fast enough. Um, but uh, there are initiatives, there are different ways. Of course, to get agreement of 27 member states, it's not uh, sometimes uh, very easy. But I feel that this is a priority for, for Commission. So, I'm, um, so, so we can see those numbers. 
but it doesn't mean that uh, we are not that the EU is not uh, working working on that. Uh, same goes for the trade, uh, and I think we need to distinguish uh, how dangerous the goods which goes. Uh, this way is. I think uh, first and foremost we need to focus on things uh, which can be directly used in, in war and then maybe try to continue with the others and find the right way how to enforce our uh, sanctions also extraterritorially. Um, and uh, you, you ask about energies. Uh, it's a reality of Central Europe that uh, part of the Central Europe is uh, I would use semi-dependent on, uh, on those Russian deliveries. Hungary is a demand that they will deliver, that they will get uh, uh, whatever they need uh, as, as long as they need. Uh, but my government, Czechia's government, is doing everything to get rid of the dependency on the Russian, uh, Russian uh, energy deliveries. So now we are fully independent on gas uh, through the LNG in the Netherlands. Uh, we are looking for other ways how to interconnect through Poland. Um, this is the project Stork, which uh, is not now being, uh, being materialized, but the idea is here, and I think it will remain here for some time. Um, we are upgrading a pipeline going from the Tars through, through Italy, through Austria, to Germany, and to Czechia. So uh, we are switching our refineries, also in Polish hands, by the way. Uh, so, so cooperation with Poland is very important on our energy security. Uh, and, um, uh, and we are also getting, uh, getting uh, rid of the dependency on nuclear fuel. So we are doing our homework, and I think it's a good example for other countries in Central Europe uh, to do it uh, the same way, uh, even though we know that the position is, is uh, what it is. So, so definitely uh, uh, Czechia is okay, and uh, we don't need any, any, basically any more derogations from sanctions since, um, uh, since I hope that in the new sanction packages uh, as they are being rolled out since we were able to solve it uh, like this. So. Thank you. But it will be decided, so this is not the final statement of my yeah. government on sanctions. Anybody else? Yes, so, please. So, so maybe just a few words just to also compliment. I, I, I wanted to underline that even if the, some goods uh, Russia manages to procure through third countries, mm -hmm. it's very important to note that the that uh, even if in fact the physically the goods are reaching Russia, they are reaching Russia at a higher price and at a, through a more Good restricted point. channels. So it's, a, it's actually, it, it, it is not a proof that the sanctions are not effective. They are circumvented, but, but they, they are effective in this, in this way. And if we look at the, uh, at a kind of from the bird's eye perspective on the effect on, on Russian military cap capabilities and so on, they are, we see uh, that, 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 they, that they are working. And, uh, not, you know, the, the, and, and then we should also appreciate that the secondary sanctions were a taboo in Europe for forever, and we managed to break it now. It was the, the eighth sanction package that, that we worked also together, Poland with Netherlands, pushed through these issues, and then, you know, made a, a lot of progress further. So, it's a, of course, it's always a, we, we want ever more, as, as the minister said, but, uh, but, uh, but we really... Uh, are, are, uh, have achieved a, a, a lot. And, and then, um, uh, then the, 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 there were so many things that were mentioned, but I, I don't know if I should have... Uh, it's should okay, just, uh, you yes. can come back after it's anybody else. Okay, so okay. Just yes. follow up on this question, Please. whether there is an appetite for a new mm. package of sanctions. Mm. Do you think this will be put on the table, anything concretely discussed? At the EU the end of the year, yeah. In Brussels. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the 12th package of sanctions is, is very much being discussed, and, uh, and we are very active, of course, in this discussion, as always, uh, regarding individual sanctions. That's, uh, we have always worked on the strengthening the lists and so on, and uh, regarding the different sectors, right? Uh, you know, the, 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 the many were mentioned already, but, you know, one wasn't mentioned diamonds, for instance, right? And, uh, uh, but... Uh, so, so we we are um, very much working on this and uh, on on the 12th package of sanctions, and we hope that this will uh, happen. Mm -hmm. okay. Are you uh, optimistic? I'm I'm optimistic. Good. <laughs> but, okay. I think Abdul that uh, 
Thank you, Minister, for such a, a, an example. And I kindly ask you to use all your political efforts to <laughs> share with this experience, especially with the other neighborhood countries like Hungary, uh, or now we also see some challenges, uh, of course, in Slovakia. That is why I think the, uh, your experience and your example has to be multi multiply and uh, also regarding um, compliance regime. Mm -hmm. I think, again, I really would like to underline about uh, this cooperation for countries of G7, NATO and EU on in intelligence security because it's also about uh, struggling, it's also uh, about uh, all the monitoring in the co systems and economic operators. So I think that this international criminal um, network as well uh, will be successful if we will use uh, more, more, more synergy between the institutions. Okay. What can we do about allies, sometimes close allies in different areas that are actually supporting uh, sanctions evasions? Is there something we can do about that? <laughs> we, we, we raised this uh, question wherever, you know, I, I, I had a few trips to the Caucasus recently and they you know like we we mentioned Central Asia and so on. It's, uh, th these are partners with all, all our countries have uh, multi-layered relations and so on, comprehensive relations, and, uh, and it's important to apply political pressure. But I think more importantly than political pressure, I think they react to uh, real EU legislation, right? And mm. real EU regulations that, uh, that are going to affect uh, companies that are going to avoid uh, the, the sanctions regime. I think this is really a... Um, um, something that a lot of uh, countries, I think, takes is increasingly seriously because they see that Europe is increasingly serious about it. Thank you. Let me yes. just jump yeah, in. I, I will yeah. come to you, but if you have any questions, please raise your hand and look at Hernan. There's a lady in the front here after we finish, but anybody else, please raise your hand. And uh, my friend Hernan will bring the microphone to you. But before that, I want to listen to... Uh, J just uh, one comment on... Um, the importance of exposure and transparency and this is where you know investigative journalism mm -hmm. civil society comes and in and i do know that in ukraine there are a lot of very you know powerful coalitions to actually expose sanction evasion to uh, advocate for making russia pay for its uh, atrocities and destruction and uh, i think that there's it's one question what do we do within the alliance that is, that is actually where we have some compliance and standards. Another one, what we do with countries like Kazakhstan. There was an interesting turn of uh, leadership saying that they will now comply with sanctions. Uh, whether they will walk the talk, it's, it's something to watch. Mm. But I think, you see, once there will be a sense that Russia is losing, Mm. More and more countries will be abandoning uh, trade because of the damages it will cause for their own future. So the sanctions are closely related to Russia's failures or successes on the battlefield. So that is why um, a, a kind of putting this two-track pressure could be really effective. It's not one or the other, and, and we should always remember that, that they are hedging their bets. Those countries that are, you know, trying so far to perhaps avoid it and uh, do some service to Moscow, once they see that Russia has no chance of winning it, that we'll see more and more countries complying. Thank you. Yes, please. I mean, Brenda. everything Orisi has been saying is, is incredibly important, and I think it's important to remember the rhetorical and reputational value of sanctions as well, that that has a much wider resonance beyond just those who are sanctioned. Uh, you'll recall the massive flight away from Russia of international companies operating there because they realized that whatever money they're making operating in Russia is not worth as much as what they're losing reputationally and in terms of concrete costs internationally because of how horrified the world is and continues to be by um, Russia's acts of aggression and uh, atrocity. And I think, you know, when you're talking about how do we work with allies that aren't necessarily uh, stepping up as much as they should be, that works just the same with them. The more we're exposing the evasions, as Arisia put it, but also the more that we're talking about the crimes, it makes it unacceptable for them to continue to evade sanctions. But I would add one uh, 
point as well, that we should look for more allies. There's a lot of countries on the sidelines that could be encouraged to stand up. And uh, I know I said it before, but uh, it's worth reiterating how important and the moral clarity and courage of Czechia in going beyond the European Union uh, mm -hmm. sanctions model and having an independent, autonomous domestic sanctions framework. And I think that provides a model for many other countries within the EU, but also outside the EU, and that just strengthens enforcement and coordination in other jurisdictions. So I think we need to be uh, encouraging other parliaments, other governments to be adopting their own Magnitsky laws and frameworks and to be acting upon them. Thank you very much. And, al and also, uh, Brendan mentioned regarding synergy between NGOs and the governments. Mm -hmm. I think that it's really a very good point because it's also about communication campaign. Uh, uh, as, uh, you know, the synergy, again, uh, and networking, especially between Ukrainian NGOs and other NGOs, it, 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 we, we will, uh, the speed will be different. Uh, and also, I'm sure that the decision-making process, uh, uh, the, the, this timing will be different. Uh, and and uh, when we are talking about war crimes, for example, Graza, village Graza, for one minute, almost 60 people of the village, it's like part of the village, uh, have been killed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have also to, to show these pictures and photos that this is a, a civilian people and it's the whole families have been killed. I, I think you both have identified a very important uh, uh, point here. Uh, the issue of synergies and coalitions, not just across uh, in, uh, countries, but within a country itself. How can you build these coalitions? And don't forget the private sector. Don't bring, forget the businesses that are so essential mm -hmm. to making sanctions work. And if you want them to be part of sanctions, they have to be part of the decision making about sanctions. So their voice needs to be heard as we're designing these sanctions moving forward. I think that we have this example, for example, in the EU on, during COVID time. Yeah, that was exactly. a compensation a mechanism. I exactly. mean, that was discussions. Exactly. So it's doable. They need to be part of the conversation upstream, not just, not just downstream. Here you have to do that. But upstream, yeah. when we're designing these policies, they have to be heard. What works and what doesn't work. I'm sorry, young lady, you've been waiting for so long. Identify yourself uh, and then be as brief as you can. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jala Bayramova and I'm from Azerbaijan. Uh, my father, Dr. Gubar Badullah, has been investigating that how Azerbaijan is selling EU the Russian oil, uh, Russian gas, especially gas and oil. And now he's in prison, he's arrested. Um, he, he cannot even move, has a dysfunction on his left heart. My mom was beaten by Azerbaijani police, all her body in bruises. And I am not even talking about how the, in, according to Freedom House, Azerbaijan human rights condition is worse than Russia, Iran, and Belarus is exactly the same as China. But I agree that we need to, with Mr. Litsovich, Litsovich, that we need to close all loopholes, including Azerbaijan. But Azerbaijan, I'm sorry, but Azerbaijan is still gaining a lot of reputation and still being praised and still has been like um, abusing everybody in the country. Just, just yesterday, the Eurasia Net published that uh, Azerbaijan has, is going to refine 200,000 barrels of Russian oil every day. And if we're going to sanction Russia, but let Azerbaijan to provide everything with Russia, sell their oil and gas to the EU, what is the meaning of the sanctions? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, human rights within a country and sanctions and how that relates. Anybody want to answer that? Maybe you, Brandon. That's your area. Sure. Well, uh, <laughs> firstly, thank you, Jala, for raising that important point and, and also just to affirm that I'm sure I speak for everyone in the room when I say that we stand in solidarity with your, your father who's facing unjust imprisonment and, and admire his courage in uh, standing up for his principles uh, and, and, you know, paying the cost for that. Um, you know, I, I think her, her point is, is so apt in that, True. you know, we can't just look at this as you know, you know, I remember from the Komna Radna had, had, had put it as, as a Ukrainian issue or a Russia issue. This is a new Cold War of rights abusing regimes, atrocity perpetrators versus the free world and rights respecting regime, uh, rights respecting, you know, uh, countries, democracies. When you look at the coordination and cooperation um, of Russia with Iran, with China, with North Korea, all these bad actors coalesce, and I think we're doing ourselves a disservice as free societies to pivot from one authoritarian regime, however heinous it might be, to another one. Um, we have to work collectively, coordinate as free societies to ensure that we are 
um, going after all the bad actors wherever they may be. And I do not think it is arbitrary or random that uh, President Vladimir Zelensky was the first world leader to speak out, and persistently so, on Hamas's heinous acts of aggression against Israeli civilians. Russia denies Ukraine's right to exist, Iran denies Israel's right to exist, and is seeking to annihilate via its proxy Hamas. And they are coordinated, they're acting together, and we must support Ukraine uh, with its right to self-defense under international law to ensure that it wins in this war, and we must do the same with Israel to ensure that it denies Hamas the ability to carry out these acts of aggression and atrocities against civilians. And I think the fact that you know, Iran is supplying drones to Russia, Russia is providing diplomatic support and intelligence to Iran, all of them are coordinating amongst each other. And if we are pivoting to another uh, authoritarian regime, even if they're not necessarily aligned in terms of values, in terms of systems, you know, they are aligned. And I think to the second point of, of Jela's question about Azerbaijan in particular, um, and the case of her father as a dissident, we need to be centering those stories. When you talk about the messaging, Azerbaijan or any other authoritarian regime, they pour in a ton of money into our democracies. Again, going back to Abdu, some of your research on corrosive effects of corrupt mm -hmm. foreign capital, that makes it muddies the waters. It makes it harder to tell the good from the bad. So I think when we focus on the individual stories of people like Jala's father, it really exposes the corruption of some of those systems. Um, and sanctions can be a tool for that too. Arbitrary detention, hostage taking, is a grave breach of international human rights law of our common humanity, and sanctions can redress that while also centering those stories. So when we see a political prisoner, we should be implementing targeted sanctions on all those involved in their arbitrary detention, from the prison officials to the uh, prosecutors to the false witnesses. Uh, our sanctions coalition uh, did that in the case of Vladimir Karamurza, who is a regular speaker here, sentenced to 25 years in prison in Russia for opposing the, the war of, uh, of aggression in, in, uh, against Ukraine. And, uh, that set a precedent. Canada, and then the US, and then the UK sanctioned his oppressors. And we hear from Thank Vladimir you. in prison that uh, the guards watch out. They say, hey, please make sure that we're not on the sanctions list. And to conclude, I would say, you know, for Hamas's holding of uh, over 100 uh, Israeli civilians, an elderly wheelchair-bound Holocaust survivor, a six-month-old baby, that uh, those hosting Hamas leadership, Qatar, Turkey, and uh, those with direct command responsibility and international law for those crimes, they should be sanctioned too. Sanction the Qatari officials, sanction the Turkish officials. That's what officials. I'm talking about when you talk about allies. That's what I yeah, meant when I talk exactly. about allies. But uh, we're, running, allies, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're out of time. I wish we had two hours for this. It's such an important uh, discussion. But please, join me in thanking this wonderful, wonderful panel. Uh, Minister Lipovsky, uh, Brandon Silver, uh, Maria Inova, Inova, member of the Ukrainian parliament, Mr. Gervel, and of course, Orissia. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it.